fight or flight response. But there's plenty of ways to get into that. The inappropriate response, or I should say it's inappropriate to only have this response, is to tell people to just be less stressed and get some good sleep. I mean, that's a great way to go about it. But everybody would have done this already if they could do it. And it's also not the only causes of fibromyalgia. The better approach is to understand that it's an overall increased adrenaline, increased adrenaline cycling. So we need to find out ways to lower adrenaline and stabilize adrenaline. And first, you need to understand how that works. So we'll first get into causes and then show the, how this causes the pain and other symptoms. This is outlined in the book. And it, we created kind of a grading system. So you can see if fibromyalgia is possible or likely. And this is very helpful. At times, people don't have any causes, so they'll look for hidden causes. As doctors, if we don't have any causes, including hi hidden causes, we really think we're missing something, like lupus or significant arthritis. There's some underlying cause if people have no stress, don't have sleep disorders, sleep great, everything's wonderful, but they have this undiagnosable pain. So um, we give one point for poor, interrupted, non-refreshing sleep. People may even be aware of the looking at the clock every hour, just waking up tired. Or some people think they sleep great, but wake up incredibly tired. The wife may say, or the husband, that they have snoring, they seem to stop breathing in their sleep or take significant pauses. So they might have something that we give two points to, or maybe even more we should give, to uh, undiagnosed sleep apnea, literally suffocating at night. That's a huge response of adrenaline, and uh, we'll get more into that as we review sleep apnea. One point for stress, and then two points for the more serious causes of stress, meaning even more adrenaline than simple stress. Anxiety or panic disorders, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia, and other psychiatric disorders. We'll go into each of these causes a little more in depth shortly. Um, step, uh, two points for severe osteoarthritis, wear and tear of the joints, lupus, rheumatoid, and other painful rheumatic diseases. And this is why fibromyalgia patients are usually seen by rheumatologists, probably for two reasons. One. So many of our diseases cause pain that we're asked to sort out pain. But number two, our diseases cause fibromyalgia, having so much pain and interrupted sleep. Um, number two, uh, another two points for particular painful trauma from a particular incident, and this is argued a lot in the courts. I was fine. Yes, I didn't, maybe didn't sleep well, I was a little stressed, but I had no pain until I had my car accident and the car accident's well healed, it doesn't make any sense why the person still has pain and worsening sleep, but that one trauma might have pushed them over into a cycle of fibromyalgia, and we'll review how that works. And one point for restless leg syndromes and hypermobility, those are not really um, causes of fibromyalgia as much as uh, effects, but if you see those, it's a little more likely the person has fibromyalgia. The second part of the test is, do you have symptoms of depleted adrenaline? General pain or aches, people will describe it as, like I have the flu. It's the most common description. But the second one that's also very common is hit, like I uh, got hit by a Mack truck in the morning. Stiffness, numbness. Uh, over the years, I've had one or two patients a year now that I didn't recognize when I first wrote the book, that they'll present pure, purely neurological, severe numbness and tingling in the extremities, even feel weak. And they'll have one or two sets of EMGs, those needle tests that show how the nerves work, and it might show normal, usually normal, maybe mild neuropathy, but they'll swear they have MS. It doesn't seem like fibromyalgia, it seems all neurological. and that rarely um, can be the only presentation of fibromyalgia. Itching, too hot or too cold, 
extreme sensitivity to bright lights and loud noises, unsettling shifts in tastes and smells, flushed skin, fear of crowds, just all that intense stimulation, fatigue, and confusion. So what you're seeing here is it's not just pain. It's all sensations are amplified or felt more than they should. Also, see at the bottom, if these symptoms vary with the causes, such as your sleep or your stress or flares of your arthritis, then it's even more likely that it's fibromyalgia. That can vary two ways. One, if you sleep worse, have more stress, you'll use up more chemicals and have more symptoms. The other way that kind of fools people sometimes is you'll feel great during stress. People will ask, well, how come I had no pain during my husband's heart surgery? But when we got him home finally, all of my pain and fatigue came back. It's because um, usually no matter how much depleted you are in adrenaline, no one's completely uh, depleted, you can still whip up some adrenaline to get through something. But if your tank is low to begin with and you whip some up, you'll feel better temporarily. But when it's over, you'll crash and have a giant flare more than ever. The third test, um, if you regulate your dopamine with medication and it helps your pain, it's virtually guaranteed to be fibromyalgia. But we'll talk about the dopamine drugs. But you, it's not just Parkinson's dopamine medications. It's also nerve blocking medications are more effective in fibromyalgia than, let's say, Advil or Aleve, because it's a neurological processing problem. So, what's normal and what's fibromyalgia? I'm going to look for a, a pointer. Okay. Well, I don't have a pointer, so I'm going to walk over to the screen. Um, normal adrenaline cycles is, on the left there, is restful sleep. We were all meant to raise adrenaline to a certain level and then cycle for sleep. Raise adrenaline to a circle level and cycle for sleep. And this happens normally. This is one of the reasons um, heart attacks happen at five or six in the morning, because people uh, are on the edge of having a heart attack because of blocked vessels. The cortisol and other adrenalines will start to raise to get ready to wake you up, because they're relaxed at night and they're building up and they start to um, start to wake up again and get used at five or six in the morning getting ready for the day to a normal level down and cycle what we found with fibromyalgia patients is they're always in an above average level of adrenaline they net they're using higher adrenaline during the day because of all the causes and they never quite cycle down at night. So poor sleep is a problem not because you need to make some more adrenaline at night. It's a problem because you're supposed to be hibernating at night. And just stop using up the adrenalines and allow them to rest and rebuild and stop using it up. You're supposed to be hibernating. That's normal. But if you have these interrupted sleep with suffocating from sleep apnea, or you're just not hibernating, you have light sleep, you won't rebuild your adrenaline overnight and allow it to catch up. So misconceptions about fibromyalgia. I still hear these every week, uh, even though they're all wrong. I'll ask patients, well, what do they think fibromyalgia is, or what have they been told by their doctor? And the doctors and patients will say, well, I've heard it was arthritis in the muscles. That was guesswork from the 70s and 80s. It's been disproved through many studies, but it's still out there. Fibromyalgia is inflammation in the muscles, also incorrect. Fibromyalgia is only due to depression and psychological imbalances, incorrect. So how does fibromyalgia actually work? On the left here, all of us have sensations. 
you feel something. But to be able to, for my brain to know that, my nerve has to feel it. It has to go through my spinal cord, through my limbic system, which is the base of the brain that runs fear and fight or flight. And it has to make it into my sensation, and then I know it happened. Normally, I shouldn't feel everything, every second. Although it's an evolutionary advantage to feel some things. I should feel something crawling on me that might bite me, but I shouldn't be aware of every stitch of clothing on me at every second. So there has to be some sort of filter that the brain has developed to tell us when to feel something. When is it safe? When do we need to know for our safety? And it turns out that dopamine, specifically dopamine 3, runs that at the base of our brain and our survival center. So a normal level of dopamine in the limbic system, you'll see some sensations come up, but only to a certain level should you see them. Sh I mean, should you feel them, hear them, sense them, smell them. The middle figure is when someone is in acute stress. Okay, So all of us can get our adrenaline up in a fight or a car accident or some emergency. Real chemicals go up in the brain and help us survive. They wake us up, they help us concentrate, they give us energy, and they block pain so you can survive that emergency. And dopamine 3 specifically in the limbic system in the survival center is responsible for blocking the pain. So what's fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia unfortunately is the all the way on the right. When, you, when this goes on long enough, so all humans and animals do this better than humans, are meant to have, we're meant to get up, our adrenaline up in emergency, drop back down to normal. Get our adrenaline up in emergency, drop back down to normal. Unfortunately in fibromyalgia, this goes, the stresses and the poor restorative sleep. So we use up, as you saw in that cycle of adrenaline, it's always above the line, only drips down a little bit low, not getting enough, stressing too much during the day, not hibernating at night. You'll eventually run through these chemicals and they'll get lower and lower and they'll be in the basement, lower than they were ever meant to be. Then you lose your filter. So you simply, fibromyalgia is simply the opposite of the survival response and you just start to look like the opposite of your survival response. So what happens in an emergency in a normal person? You get your adrenaline up, you're awake, you're concentrating, you're blocking sensations, you're surviving until that's over. You will start to look like the opposite. Adrenaline's in the tank, you're tired, dopey, confused, can't remember where you put your car keys, and you start to feel everything more than you're supposed to. Not just pain, it's anything that's actually wrong with you you'll feel more than you were meant to. And it's been well proven, especially we've pr proven with beyond a, any doubt that humans have depleted adrenaline who have fibromyalgia and live in a higher state of adrenaline. And we've been proven in rats that this is exactly how it works. So the truth about fibromyalgia is it's chronic stress, and that doesn't mean just psychological stress. Anything that releases adrenaline leads to less than normal dopamine levels. That's fibromyalgia. But unfortunately, it's called fibromyalgia <laughs> because people thought it was something wrong in the fibers of the muscles when this first started being described. It used to be called fibrositis at first, and then fibromyalgia was thought was to be more accurate. There's a field of medicine that is just starting to get described as central nervous system processing disorders. Fibromyalgia is an extreme example where you get pain. And fibromyalgia is usually all the symptoms that lump into the uh, central nervous system, the brain, are called fibromyalgia. But the bladder has its own nervous system. And when the bladder does strange things under stress, it's called interstitial cystitis. You feel like you have to pee all the time, you have a urinary tract infection. And the bowel has a very sensitive nervous system. And when that goes crazy under adrenaline, it's called irritable bowel syndrome. 
billions, uh, probably hundreds of millions, if not billions, are spent on that every year, scoping people, trying to find out the cause with scans and ER admissions. So the bowel learns to sense things that it shouldn't under high adrenaline and contract or relax, constipation, diarrhea, or alternating. So there's other organ systems uh, involved with uh, when adrenaline goes awry. So the main objective for patients with fibromyalgia is to tame the overactive lim limit system, allowing dopamine to normalize. We hope that once you understand the causes, it's a little bit uh, easier to work on them and, ex and understand what medications you need also and what decisions to make in life. So, um, the causes of um, fibromyalgia, um, there's five stages of sleep. Stage one, two, three, four, and then REM, which is right before one, is dream state. People um, with fibromyalgia have been proven not to have the stage three and four sleep, the ones that you can pick up your five-year-old and bring them to another room and they're just dead to the world. That's stage three and four sleep, very restorative sleep. Many people have less of this as they age, but we'll see fibromyalgia patients who have sleep studies and there's no sleep apnea, but there's also very little stage three and no stage four sleep. And Moldovsky is kind of a, a pulmonologist who's well known for proving that he can take medical students, honk a horn, this famous experiment, right at the beginning of stage three sleep, wake him up violently, and after the third or fourth night, his medical students started to develop signs of fibromyalgia. Achy, even irobal, nauseous, like they had the flu, confused, dopey, if you interrupt sleep just right. But if you're in the jungle with your rifle and you're starting to doze, that's very helpful to keep the sleep light and not let person get into deep sleep. Sleep apnea, very important hidden cause of fibromyalgia. You can imagine if your oxygen's going low, we all have a reflex to wake us up. So patients with untreated sleep apnea may have hundreds of these mammalian diving reflex where you wake up and a surge of adrenaline wakes you up to breathe again. And that'll happen automatically when the oxygen gets below a certain percentage. So undiagnosed sleep apnea or people who are un unable to tolerate the breathing device that is needed for that um, have very difficult to treat fibromyalgia often. Uh, and a special um, word to men with fibromyalgia. So women have an average of 2 to 4% of untreated fibromyalgia if you look at a group of 100 fibromyalgia patients. But men, 45 or 44 out of 100 have undiagnosed sleep apnea. So it's almost 50%. So all men and women with a lot of risk factors should be tested for sleep apnea if they have signs of fibromyalgia. Stress. Any stress might be hard to understand. And we'll talk about that in part two for people that stay um, for that lecture on how to control the fight or flight response. But our brain is hooked up with a nerve that branches to the top of both adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys. Any time the brain thinks anything is wrong, we release adrenaline, and that's automatic. Everybody has that. So stress is simply anything is wrong. You release adrenaline, and you get that feeling like you have to survive. So if your brain is worried about being late, or you have a bad disc in your back, the brain pretty much has no, it's the exact same pathway in your brain. Something's wrong, nerve goes down, signals adrenaline release, and it's the exact same hookup in your brain. Your brain doesn't know the difference between psychological and physical stresses. It's all the exact same hookup. Anxiety and panic disorders, These are just more and more adrenaline, more intense than simple stress. Generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorders, obviously um, set you up for fibromyalgia. 
depression. Depression is not a state of simply checking out or feeling low. It's also something is wrong. Thank you. With depression, something is wrong. This, it, it is a high state of adrenaline, and we're still releasing adrenaline that the brain is seeing a problem. Post-traumatic stress disorder. This can best, at first, when I was taught in medical school, all patients with fibromyalgia had post-traumatic stress disorder, and that at, at once was thought to be the only cause of fibromyalgia. All these people were abused in the past. Of course, it's it's a common cause of fibromyalgia, but it's not the only cause of fibromyalgia. Somebody with severe arthritis and sleep apnea can have horrible fibromyalgia and have a completely non-traumatic past and not much stress in their life at all. But PTSD can be thought of as you might be past the trauma and you don't really even have to be thinking about the trauma. It's just this general Hyper-awareness, everything has to be hyper-worried about and hyper-safe because you spent a lot of time not being safe and now the brain is trying to go overboard, protecting. So you could literally worry more about your own kids or the, how clean the kitchen countertops are because you're abused in the past. Might sound crazy, but the brain gets into this hyper-adrenaline, hyper-worrying state. Everything has to be safer than someone who wasn't abused in the past. Bipolar disorder, these can be brought on by abuse, but they're thought to be mainly organic brain disorders that are hard to control and need medications. And unfortunately, fibromyalgia is a bad side effect of bipolar disorder. And schizophrenia and other mental illness, for obvious reasons, can cause stress and fibromyalgia. Osteoarthritis, lupus, rheumatoid, we can understand why a severe painful disorder would make you raise a lot of adrenaline, make you very stressed, and if you think about it, also greatly interrupt your sleep. So you can see why somebody with arthritis would have all the causes of fibromyalgia given to them. So that's why um, our diseases are um, sometimes awful causes of fibromyalgia. I, I tell many people, severe arthritis all over that has no treatment, you've maybe had some failed surgeries or there's too many arthritic levels in the spine to operate on and you're absolutely miserable in pain and you can't sleep and can't get comfortable, that's probably the, one of the worst causes of fibromyalgia there is, severe ongoing painful disorders. There'll be plenty of time for uh, questions. Uh, painful trauma from a particular incident, so this is the one that's argued about in courts or Patients will swear to me, I was fine until I had my gallbladder out and I only spent eight days in the hospital. It was infected and I was very sick and I came home in pain and the pain hasn't gone away for eight years. Doctor says there's no way that can happen. Hypermobility, double jointed and restless legs. So hypermobility is interesting. There's been some new data coming out with hypermobility that one of, the one of the main reasons it might cause fibromyalgia is there's something about the genes. If you're double-jointed, you tend towards more anxiety and depression. And no one knows why that might be a survival advantage, but we, that's why we see a link with fibromyalgia. That's what the thought is. Restless leg syndromes, that's more a side effect of high adrenaline. If you're living in high adrenaline for whatever the reason, stress, pain, and as Restless leg syndrome is this horrible jerking. It doesn't have to be just the legs, it could be the body, as you're trying to relax and fall asleep. It's not simply muscle cramps. It's a survival instinct to wake up and not let that brain lower adrenaline and relax and go to sleep. It'll save your life in, the, in a war in the jungle, but it's not an advantage when life is safe and you're at home in a locked uh, house in your bedroom. But it'll still happen if someone's living in high adrenaline and one of the keys to this is it doesn't happen when you're busy doing stuff. It's only when you try to turn the brain off and relax and get out of adrenaline, it wants to bring you back in because the brain thinks it's not safe to relax and lower that adrenaline. So how does this throw you over? This is a very common story. Someone has eh, not the greatest sleep, stress, maybe depressed once in a while, 
Or they could have yeah, a little stress, but they sleep great. But then they have their first baby. Now the sleep's worse, the stress worse, might have some depression because it's too, life is too hard all of a sudden. And there's also, of course, other causes of um, postpartum depression. At some point, you get just enough depleted dopamine to start to feel your own sensations more than you were meant to. Then you start to feel pain that doesn't make sense. You might have worsening sleep because of the pain and the stress is going on. And more stress, more depression lead to further dopamine depletion. And you can imagine now this is just a self-perpetuating cycle. Once you get into, it can self-generate itself, unfortunately, unless you break the cycle. One thing that might be a little encouraging here is a lot of patients tell me they, and I see patients, now I've been seeing patients 10 years later, or they had fibromyalgia in the 80s and now I'm seeing them for rheumatoid, but fibromyalgia is long gone. People outgrow their fibromyalgia. But what, what happens, if they're going to, okay, is they outgrow the causes. They're retired. The kids are out of the house. Life has just calmed down. The financial stresses are over. Maybe not these days, but they're over. You know, or they improve. Life, the causes naturally improve. And many people, not all, outgrow their fibromyalgia. What if you don't have any of the causes on the list? Well, perhaps there's something else going on. So this is why we check an ANA, anti-nuclear antibody. The slang for that is a lupus test, because it's one of the most common things you see. But there's, and thyroid and things like that. There's a set of routine blood work and examination, sometimes testing, that needs to be done to make sure that there, this is fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia, is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's a clinical diagnosis. There's no blood test. That's why you're all here, kind of, because this is, won't be taken seriously or seriously studied or understood until there's a blood test. There is no blood test right now. So this is like thyroid 200 years ago. Thyroid wasn't real. Hypothyroidism wasn't believed 200 years ago because there was no blood test. And if you took ground up cow extract, they used to, um, combine thyroid, adrenal, and pituitary from cows in one extract and take that. And if you went from gaining weight, not being strong enough to work the fields, being cold, your hair falling out, and this extract of thyroid helped you, you were working again, everything got better, your doctor would say, well, you're just imagining you're better. There's no such thing as thyroid. And now there's a blood test and a treatment and a number that comes out. Now we're all crazy not to believe in thyroid. So fibromyalgia will be like that someday, but there is no blood test. There's no way to accurately test adrenaline by blood. There are great experimental ways, and we've proven that humans are in high adrenaline who um, get fibromyalgia, but we don't have a simple blood test. And that leads to a lot of confusion, guesswork, judgments by doctors and patients and family. And many patients can't even believe that this is really how it works. But once there's a blood test, there'll be a great leap forward in studying this and treating this. Oh, so um, if you don't have any of the causes, you should see your doctor. But if this really does seem like fibromyalgia, maybe there's a hidden cause that's hard to detect or treat, like sleep apnea. Maybe your adrenaline's higher than you know. I've had patients who tell me, I don't have any stress. Everything's great. There's nothing wrong with my life. Growing up was wonderful. And then you'd ask, well, why do you only sleep four hours a night? But I don't know. I never do. You know? So maybe your adrenaline is higher than you realize. Misconceptions about fibromyalgia, it's not from being overweight, lack of exercise, diet or eating habits, your posture, what you choose to do in life, exposure to chemicals, yeast infections, candida. And don't get me wrong. I mean, if you have yeast, if you have a poor diet, 
if you're eating a lot of inflammatory foods, once you have depleted adrenaline, you'll notice everything that's wrong with you more than you should. So improving your diet might make you feel better. The same with irritable bowel syndrome. When your gut goes crazy, all of a sudden, it becomes hard to digest certain foods. But that doesn't mean that all irritable bowel syndrome is uh, gluten sensitivity. It just is harder to digest certain foods. And you're going to feel like lots of things seem to help fibromyalgia, but that doesn't mean it's the cause of fibromyalgia. You are not responsible for your condition. And this is tough because we're telling you to clean up your life, work on the causes. But this is usually a result of what was given to you. This means family members, what happened to you, what was done to you when you were raised. And then you might leave life, leave, go into the world in a state of hyper safety, hyper vigilance. But also the bad luck of what diseases you've had. The simple luck of how successful your career was. If you've had disabled children, you'll get fibromyalgia. Any problem that the brain, your particular brain, feels is worth raising adrenaline over, and how you develop to develop that list, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, um, will kick you into having fibromyalgia. So as you go on in life, fibromyalgia is initiated. You'll have, you can add the causes, poor sleep, anxiety, sleep apnea. As you get more arthritis, it might get harder and harder to dig yourself out of this. What triggered the cycle for you? Often people can tell. It'll be something that happened within months or the year or two of starting to have pain. You might think you had great sleep when it was really only five or six hours, but it always seemed like enough. And then once people have pain, They'll say, I stopped, started sleeping poorly once I had pain. But really, it was just six hours was then lowered to three or four hours when there was so much pain and stress and increased symptoms. Fibromyalgia does not cause any bodily harm aside from the pain and discomfort. It's a neurological processing disorder. This doesn't mean that poor sleep and stress themselves won't eventually have effects on your body. But the fibromyalgia itself, the dopamine depletion, it is reversible. And unfortunately, well, it's good and bad to having no damage in the body. It's good that you're not getting damage and it won't hurt you, but you also look normal. Nothing wrong with you, right? And it's, you often don't get believed. Where if you have rheumatoid arthritis and you're all swollen and crooked, you get plenty, plenty of sympathy. And at times, fibromyalgia in the severe cases is more painful than severe rheumatoid arthritis. So why are there fibro tender points? Every person, every human being and animals have fibromyalgia tender points. Everyone hurts more right where, they where you get tennis elbow, right where the tendons and ligaments insert versus two inches away. But nobody is usually aware of this, especially just with a light touch. But they were always there in everybody. But as soon as you lower that dopamine down enough, you'll start to be aware of these without even touching. We're just moving across the floor. So everybody has all of the fibromyalgia tender points. But it became an easy way to understand and diagnose who has fibromyalgia. With four pounds of pressure, just pretty, just slightly more than light touch. Patients with fibromyalgia feel them as intensely painful, and patients without fibromyalgia won't even feel pain. They just feel like someone's, you know, kind of touching them. So that's one way we can diagnose fibromyalgia. Why do people with fibromyalgia get tight knots in their muscles? It's the same idea. We all get tight knots in our muscles after a lot of overuse, but that will become severe to somebody with lower dopamine. Uh, in the book, we made up some graphics to understand this. I'll just do this one. Um, see, I'm going to go to 
carpal tunnel, okay? If you have a slight feeling in your carpal tunnel, many, many people, adults, actually, I think something like 80% of people who have an EMG above 50 have carpal tunnel syndrome, <coughs> but 10% feel it, okay? Um, if the carpal tunnel is a three, and the normal dopamine threshold to feel pain is level, let's just say a five, this person is unaware that they're having a little compression in the carpal tunnel. And that's 70% of people above 50 have some carpal tunnel on electrical testing and don't know it. If you have mild fibromyalgia, your dopamine is depleted down to two, and this is a three, you'll feel it as a mild pain, and you might be told to do a brace. Fibro severe fibromyalgia with greatly depleted dopamine, that three is completely felt, and they're, they have the same finding on EMG as an adult with normal dopamine, but instead of not feeling it at all, they're getting surgery. And in a way, the surgery was correct. And they're very happy they got the surgery, because they took that real problem away. But if they had real dopamine, they wouldn't even know they had it. It's also the same reason why some patients with severe fibromyalgia, especially with spine surgery, don't get better. Slowly, surgeons are learning this. They're learning that patients with a fibromyalgia um, background, a hyper, they'll call it a chronic pain background, are much less likely to get better with spine surgery and other uh, surgeries for pain because of the depleted dopamine. Um, I once treated a police officer, we'll leave this up and it can be paused when you view it online, but a police officer went to allergists, many other doctors looking at dermatologists, finding out why he had this intense itching. And his intense itching um, went away when he was on um, vacation. But he'd have it at night in his house. So he was diagnosed as multiple hypersensitivity, changed his whole house around. It never got better. But we found that it did vary with stress. And he was lucky enough to tolerate the dopamine medications. And it helped those horrible itching sensations. But he had no pain. He would not fit the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Um, yet it still was dopamine depletion. Once we have the blood test, a lot of this will be sorted out. Why do people with fibromyalgia feel confused? That fibro fog. It's been proven that you can, inf you can just inject somebody with cortisol, a steroid, a stress hormone, and they'll start to be confused, at, even after just one dose. If people have lack of stage in three, four, sleep, that restful sleep, they'll be tired, depleted, and confused. It's simply the opposite of the survival response. Those chemicals that wake you up are depleted. Common questions. Does, is it hereditary? It might seem like it, but often it's just that stress is handed down the generations. Why do more women than men get fibromyalgia? The actual fight or flight response is different in men versus women. Like many things, it's named after only the man. Men have a fight or flight response, women don't. Men, and this doesn't just mean humans, rats, guinea pigs, dogs, the rats, male rats, when they're threatened, will fight or scatter. They'll leave. Female rats have what's called the tend and befriend adrenaline response. The female rats will hurdle up in a circle and herd together for an attack. They will not leave. So they have what's called a tend and befriend, and, and this is seen all through into humans. They're more likely to stay around in a high adrenaline situation and try to help others. Fibromyalgia does not cause migraines, irritable bowel, infections, depression, but high stress and poor sleep do. Uh, we'll be done in about um, 10 minutes. Uh, it's never too late to treat fibromyalgia. What can you do about it? Take medications for immediate relief. So the first medication that 
I always give for fibromyalgia is something for sleep. It's not for pain. I try to, that's one of the biggest improvements you can make right away is to get the patient sleeping. They'll feel calmer, they'll have a chance at restoring chemicals at night, and they might have improvements in energy, thinking, and pain with just simply improving sleep. Of course, there's lots of other things we do, and we do care about treating pain directly, but the first thing we'll do is something for pain. Um, there's lots of things you can do to make your body feel better. We can use medications to regulate adrenaline, and we also, of course, always want to work on causes. Sleep aids, very important. Narcotic pain medications, these are very helpful, but they can also worsen fibromyalgia. Let me explain why. So we know that dopamine is responsible for your pain threshold, and fibromyalgia is low dopamine. So when you give a narcotic, it binds opioid receptors, and one of the things it does is it pumps out more dopamine. And it can make you feel immediately better. But unfortunately, you're running the tank lower. And if you go from, and that can be great if you work on the causes and you do other things to maintain more dopamine. But if you rely only on narcotics, you'll feel much better when you go for, to six Vicodin from two, if you can handle the other side effects but your pain will get better. But you're running the tank lower, and after six, eight weeks, especially if there's a lot of causes or other pains, and that's keep depleting dopamine, you'll find that that six Vicodin was, is no better than two, two, three, four months down the road. And now you want eight Vicodin, Percocet, more and more narcotics. And doctors who have made the mistake of then putting the patients on morphine, and just thinking, if I just chronically increase the morphine, they'll get better, patients wind up depressed. And all the other side effects of dopamine depletion, constipated, nauseated, and the pain can be worse than ever, and it's very, very hard to treat because those narcotics further depleted the dopamine. So when I see patients on 100, three times a day of morphine, there's almost always fibromyalgia going on, unless there's some severe, obvious, horrible, painful condition. But usually the only patients that can get into that much narcotics and not get pain relief are patients with dopamine depletion. This gets very tricky, because some people have horrible arthritis and fibromyalgia. So what do you do with the narcotics? It becomes very individualized. But people should know that if it's mainly fibromyalgia, increase in the narcotics is going to haunt them later on with depression and harder to treat pain. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't take narcotics. But in general, we'll try to do enough for three or four a day at the most, trying to get some background pain relief all the time, and then using that relief to work on causes and fix other problems. Of course, medications for depression, anxiety, will lower adrenaline and help fibromyalgia. Muscle relaxants, nerve blockers, many other things can help. Exercise, massage, chiropractic, and we'll leave this list up on the internet. I always prefer to work on the causes now that we understand why they help pain, and that'll be uh, our second lecture. It seems kind of strange, but effect can become cause, okay? So you're not sleeping because of that new baby, and you start to get pain, and the pain becomes a stress and further interrupts sleep, and it can be this horrible cycle. So even though stress and sleep, poor sleep might have initiated fibromyalgia, the pain that it caused can become an effect or a cause of fibromyalgia now. So sleep causes psychological stresses during the day and painful problems are the main three categories of fibromyalgia causes. There's a lot of things you can do for psychological causes. Books, therapy, meds, distractions. One of the best ways is to have loving, supportive family and come up with a plan where life can be more acceptable to your brain to help you get over the stress. Some people 
don't get better with fibromyalgia until they finally go through with that back surgery that they needed or the hip replacement. Anything that is depleting your adrenaline um, will worsen fibromyalgia. Some people are very good at telling apart the types of pain. Fibromyalgia, in general, should feel like an all-over achy, like the flu, and specific problems, like just a right hip pain, is never fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia make, might make you feel anything that's really in your body more than you should, but some specific area is always bursitis or some particular pain. We've been using this uh, medications, uh, these dopamine agonists. So certain Parkinson's meds hit that dopamine 3 receptor. And it's been studied and proven to help fibromyalgia. But the problem is tolerance. About two-thirds of the people wind up not being able to tolerate it on their stomach in the long run. The same problem um, goes for people who try to take them for Parkinson's. So Mirapex and Requip are actually FDA approved at lower doses for restless legs. But the same medicines, if we can crank the dose higher, can help energy, pain, and confusion. And pain, if you get, if you get the doses high enough, can help pain and tolerate them. Um, but they can have a lot of side effects, and that's um, gotten in the way of getting them FDA approved. But obviously, if you directly take dopamine, and can tolerate it, you can take that depleted dopamine and run it back to normal if you can get the dose high enough. Now in rats, we can do this and prove that it works. This is one of the way, ways we know low dopamine um, is a cause of fibromyalgia. Because if you can drip dopamine directly into a rat's brain, you can stress them all they want, and they won't get that hyper pain response of fibromyalgia. As people get Better with the dopamine drugs. Lower doses, like I said, help restless jerky legs, and they'll help sleep. And as you raise the dose, confusion and sensations and pain can get better. And we talk about a protocol that you can use with your doctor in the book. How long should you treat fibromyalgia? Some people are lucky enough to just be treated for months to a year or two. Most people have causes that last their entire life. We'll talk more about that in the next lecture. How do you explain fibromyalgia to people around you? You can show friends and family, interested coworkers, that everybody has these fibromyalgia tender points. But when your dopamine is lower, you feel them much more than you should. This is what it might look like to someone with normal dopamine and depleted dopamine. Same, you can show it numerically. Somebody with normal dopamine might have a, a back that they use kind of strongly to clean out the garage, and they feel nothing still. Someone with depleted dopamine, that pain can be absolutely insanely terrible, but they have the exact same muscle tightness. Insurance companies, I think it was 1998 or 9 that um, sometime in the 90s for sure, fibromyalgia became accepted as a diagnosis for disability. Here in Oregon, it's extremely rare that it's accepted as a diagnosis uh, for disability. Judges still don't take this seriously, even though the scientific data is out there. Why? Because there's no blood test. They'll take bipolar disorder much more seriously than they will fibromyalgia. Over and over again, I'll stress that the causes are depleted adrenaline and using up adrenaline. And the best way is to normalize adrenaline naturally and with medication. What if you do all of this and nothing works? There may be hidden or untreatable causes. Something else might be going on besides fibromyalgia. And something else might be overlooked. Often, uh, it can take three or four lupus tests sometimes to actually find a positive AMA. And uh, you should not hang your hat on one test or one workup with one doctor if uh, nothing ever makes sense. 
conclusion, uh, in conclusion, no one is immune to fibromyalgia. It's not a disease. Anybody can get fibromyalgia. It's due to exhausted supply of dopamine in the brain. You can learn to live in the modern world with modern stresses and pressures if you understand this and you set your life up to normalize adrenaline, make good decisions on what will this do um, to my adrenaline. And that will be the focus of lecture number two. So the only two ways to really cure fibromyalgia is to use medications to regulate adrenaline and work on the causes to better regulate adrenaline. So thank you, and we'll uh, love to get some questions now. And we purposely didn't hand out cards, so people can just ask the question. I'll repeat it so we can hear it at home and answer. Okay. Yes? Fight or flight adrenaline? Right. Yeah. And he tested me in a weird way on everything, but he said my adrenaline was very, very low. So he gave me some of these little things that have evolved during the week, my mouth, my ear, my tongue, and so forth. And, uh, and then I kept going back to the. And amazingly, the priest had to do a little bit to get the back where I wasn't. Is that what he, so you had um, a bad back, you were adjusted, and you ha were given medication to lower adrenaline or raise adrenaline? My adrenaline was like completely off. Yeah. Because I was, I was using my, my tongue and my ear and everything. Yeah, some people will take um, natural dopamine, dopamine. And a lot of the natural products and some of the Parkins, the traditional Parkin medicines are D2 and D3. And it's hard to get enough D3 to help you. And you're lucky that you were able to tolerate that without an upset stomach. That's quite fortunate. But you, people can try these. Um, Yeah, natural dopamine, if, if that's what you took, can help a lot. Was, and I don't know. He, I don't know what it was. He just oh. took something I put under my tongue, and I, I let it dissolve there. And it just kind of, as it increased in my system, I began to feel better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people have to judge when they take those, too. It might be best at night. Often they'll make you sleepy. But some people get really revved up by these Parkinson's meds and can only tolerate them during the day. So you just kind of judge for yourself. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. How can you tell when you start getting sleep deprived before you get to the point that you get to a flare? You can, how can you tell if you're sleep deprived before it gets severe, I guess, yeah. or before you flare? Um, the scientific data says that you need six really good quality hours of sleep to function on testing putting a square peg in a square hole and having enough speed and dexterity to function. So usually five and a half to six hours of really good sleep is what science said. But they also say teenagers need at least nine hours because they're growing, et cetera. So probably anywhere from six to eight hours. And then you have to see if your mood is good, if you can function well. It can be very individual. But if you want a number I can throw out there, it's at least six hours of good sleep. And that's what I use in my practice. And if people aren't getting a good six hours at least, that's when I'll give them medication. How do you know whether you're getting the right, I mean, 
Well, sometimes you don't know if, you, if you're snoring, you have sleep apnea, um, unless someone else observes you or tests you. But there's also a scale and a questionnaire for sleep apnea, where you ask the patient, does it take hours to wake up in the morning, or are you just right up and ready to go? Okay, if you're right up and ready to go, you're probably getting good sleep. Do you fall asleep during quiet lectures? <laughs> you know, or if you're always falling asleep whenever life calms down for a little bit, you may not be sleeping enough for getting good quality sleep. People know if they're dopey or foggy often. Some people who never get good sleep or are always stressed, they think that's normal and it's hard to tell. So six hours, waking up really bright and fresh in the morning at least, and not falling asleep, having enough energy to do stuff, not needing naps during the day. These are all the things you look for. Okay? Yeah? I have sleep apnea, and I've been using a CPAP machine for three years. And if I um, allow myself to sleep until I wake up, I sleep 10 hours. <laughs> I feel great when I get up. Is that a problem, sleeping hours like that? I do wake up sometimes, no, no times at night, but typically I wake up once or twice a night to recheck. So she uses a CPAP, it's working, it's been tested, and sometimes she'll feel best if she sleeps 10 hours with it on, and then wakes up and feels the best. No, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just great. And um, taking a nap isn't that bad unless you nap too close to bedtime. And the ideal time for nap is 45 minutes or less. Once you get more than that, you get into deeper stages of sleep, and you might screw up your sleep cycle that night. So 45 minutes or less for naps, not too close to bedtime. And no, bedtime can be as long as you want if you can do it. Um, it sounds wonderful, I'm jealous, but it sounds great. Um, yeah? Um, I read somewhere recently that fibromyalgia is just a diagnosis where doctors can't figure out what's really wrong with you. So it's sort of like that garbage can thing. Yeah, it, it can be. So she's read somewhere that Fibromyalgia is a diagnosis where they just throw you into it when they can't figure it out, and it can be used like that. But we hope with what you learned here that you make an accurate diagnosis. Chronic fatigue syndrome is a lot like that. It, at first, was a diagnosis for non-cured um, Epstein-Barr virus infection. You were supposed to have classic criteria, a swollen nose, fever, sore throat, and there's rarely a person like that. But unfortunately, 99% of the other people thrown into that diagnosis have fibromyalgia, depression, lupus, something not being seen. And they're like, oh, you're tired, you have chronic fatigue syndrome, without ignoring the original criteria. Had to have a fever over 100. Had to have swollen glands. Had to have a sore throat. Um, so fibromyalgia is the same way. You can just be thrown into that. And that's where the lack of a blood test help hurts us. And yes, so it's a, a clinical diagnosis. Clinical diagnosis means it's made just by examining and talking to somebody, and there's no testing. Diagnosis of exclusion means you should exclude everything that looks like it, or acts like it, or even causes it. You can see why everybody should be thinking at least a little bit about sleep apnea. You should be thinking about lupus and other arthritis that are more subtle. Psoriasis commonly has a very subtle arthritis with it. Rheumatoid arthritis is not subtle um, to a rheumatologist, but psoriatic arthritis that goes with psoriasis is another very subtle arthritis. So if you have psoriasis, or even just psoriasis in your family, that scaly skin disease, have to look into psoriatic arthritis. This is why everyone should at least see a rheumatologist once um, with a fibromyalgia diagnosis. Um, so, you had a sleep study that showed mild to moderate apnea, and does the study just show that you don't go into these cycles? The study, uh, sleep study shows both, and you should review your own study. Most studies, they, they're mainly concerned is, do I have to treat this 
person. You know, doctors always want to treat and fix everything they can. So the sleep study is usually only looked at or mainly looked at for sleep apnea because that's the, do you need to put a device on this person to open up the airway and force it through. Um, that is a very important part of the sleep study and sometimes mild apnea you can just have the person lay on their side or not sleep on their back and that would be enough to normalize the numbers or greatly improve them at night. But there's a whole other part of that study that you can just look at right now and it'll have the percentage of sleep broken down. And you might be shocked to see that unlike regular people who are getting, you know, 30% of their sleep is this greatly restful stage three and four sleep, you might have 1% stage three and zero stage four. And the entire sleep is strikingly light. And that's a classic sleep study for fibromyalgia. So I definitely review that and look at it. Because it's great if you don't, if your apnea is not that bad, you could just sleep on your side and then take sleep medications. Yes? Yeah, it could take a while to help sleep apnea. So she said she used the machine and didn't feel that much better, but her sister felt oh, great my on it. That yeah, sometimes, well, there's lots and lots of reasons for that. Your sleep apnea could not be that bad. You could have other things that are making you feel tired and bad. Uh, yes? That's great. But so I wake up and I'm just, I am tired. Yeah. And since I haven't worked for a couple of years, I stay up late and I sleep late. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, people, that's common for people in pain or stressed that they'll stay up late. And it's really, and that'll be the hardest time with the most restlessness because the brain likes distractions and diversions and something to do. So there might be this adrenaline as, as um, there's nowhere to point that, nothing to do, and that's when the restlessness, the anxiety will perk up right before bed. You get this second wind, like you have to constantly run around and do stuff. So that's really common. Yes? No, there isn't. And as far as I know, there's no blood test um, being studied. Uh, there's Dr. Holman, who studied the dopamine, is working, has a company now where he's uh, studying adrenaline. Um, and I've been talking to him about a blood test, but nothing yet. Uh, in Seattle, or well, in uh, Washington. And, but he's also trying to study adrenaline and spinal cord compression and its effect on autoimmune disease. So it's branching a little bit more away from fibromyalgia. And fortunately, and people who see this on the internet may not like this, but one of the main groups um, has been uh, hampering fibromyalgia because there's one group that has for 30 years been trying to prove that fibromyalgia is the way your uh, brain fits into the base of your skull. And that's the only cause of fibromyalgia. And it was in the news where neurosurgeons lost their license for operating on the base of this. And 
that's where a lot of the research dollars have been, private research dollars have been going. So it's, it's really a mess. And uh, of course, the lack of blood tests, the lack of science allows all this misdirection. And a lot of judgment, even by people who probably spend, you know, decide where the research dollars go. That this is all stress and worried women and there's no need to study this. And that happens a lot. Um, with, um, oh, the new methyl folate, or? Yeah. Well, that's been around a long, long time. Um, and there's some uh, folate mutations with the B vitamins that people are looking into and what is the cause. It's still, there's still not much science there. You know, it's still being studied, but we know that B12 and B vitamins uh, get used up in stress, in those parts of the cell cycle, and taking them can make you feel better. But I have most patients I ask to take a multivitamin and a multi-B who are under stress. And then the supplements, there's so many more supplements that I can't even keep up in. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, and that, that's what's in stress tabs for the past 20 years, you know, B vitamins to help get energy. And they can make you feel energy. And uh, Deplin, that um, kind of folate type vitamin, uh, can give people some energy. But it's a very expensive vitamin. I think it's like $100 a month. Or so. uh, yes, in the front. Uh, no, we don't. Um, the treatment. The uh, next lecture will be mainly um, how to deal with the psychological causes on your own. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned dopamine and, and natural dopamine. Yeah, there's natural dopamine and prescription dopamine. Um, one of the most common natural dopamines is dopamine, and it can be used just like restless legs medicine. At night is when you usually try it, and you slowly can increase the dose as tolerated. And the higher you can get, you might have better sleep, some pain relief, but it's really hard to, it's hard. We were very encouraged with these tests back in 2004, 2005, but the longer we treated people with these dopamine medications, maybe only about a third really tolerate them in the long run. It's very hard on people's stomachs. If you're bipolar, all that dopamine and adrenaline can make you manic, and it's a lot of side effects. What do you mean by natural dopamine? Does, um, it's, well, it's, it's, uh, it's in the book, okay? And we'll put something up on the internet about that, okay? In the back there, with the sunglasses. You, so if you have interrupted sleep, maybe two hours at a time, interrupted by pain, you're, or bathroom or whatever, are you getting restful stages of sleep? It's less likely, but you're getting some, you know, but no, if you know if someone sleeps a solid eight hours and they don't have sleep apnea, they're getting more restful sleep than someone that's up and down every two hours, you know? But as you study the stage three and four sleep, more of the stage three and four sleep is earlier in the night. Your brain's pretty smart, and it tries to grab it right away, or grab it in the earlier nights, and there's less stage three and four sleep as the night goes on. That's why like the seventh, eighth, ninth, even some of the sixth hour is a little more optional for functioning on tests and stage three and four sleep. And also, if you don't sleep at all, the brain's very good at catching up and forcing you to sleep the next night and it'll grab stage three and four sleep even faster. Um, you're welcome. Yes? You, well, that's the Ritalin, well, she's saying for ADHD, if you take those medicines, they're supposed to, especially in teens, have a paradoxical effect where they don't rev you up and they help you focus. So it's all, well, it's like any decision in life. What's that going to do to my adrenaline? 
Okay? So a lot of patients who are adults can't tolerate the ADHD meds because they make them more stressed out. But if it makes you calmer, it's helping your adrenaline. You should know by paying attention if that medication lowered or raised your adrenaline, made you feel better, calmer, or not. So it's a lot of self-awareness studying your adrenaline. Any other question? Yeah. If you've had fibromyalgia and it's getting better and you're under control, mm -hmm. like really like cured almost, yes, you could always go back into it easier and you'll be a little more susceptible because you have such a hyperactive fight or flight response, it'll be, um, you'll be susceptible almost forever, you know, unless so to flare-ups. Probably not, because it depends if you had a complete, so the question was, does the response ever go back to normal? No, usually most patients with fibromyalgia have this hypervigilance, hyper safety that leads to hyperadrenaline, and this is why even some patients might be just fine, but until they have enough arthritis, but also the hypervigilance leads to hyperadrenaline over the same arthritis, where someone else might not be so affected by it. That's why you'll see a husband and a wife in the exact same situation, and only one of them gets fibromyalgia because of their particular fight or flight response. So in my case, my diagnosis was depression, and my treatment was like moving with this working on uh, two other... Right, serotonin. Right. Mm -hmm. 